Welcome and good day. I'm Ak Zahir, Dean of the Fellows. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the first of two related conversations with the Fellows. And these are webinars on the broad theme of social purpose in business. Today's session presented by Ranjay Gulati takes a deep dive into why and how firms undertake purpose. And also features, very importantly, SMS fellow Laurence Capron as a discussant. The second webinar, which I just want to tee up, will be presented by Rebecca Henderson on May 3rd at 10 a.m. Eastern. And that webinar will take a broader system level view of the role of purpose in capitalism itself. That presentation will be uh, will feature discussant Rajri Agarwal. Together, the two presentations, coupled with the discussant's perspectives, promise to provide both micro and macro level views on the role of social purpose in business and thoughtful, lively, and compelling ideas on really what is one of the most vital issues of our time. With that, let me introduce today's presenter, Ranjay Gulati, and discussant, Laurence Capron. Ranjay Gulati, who I'm pleased, very happy to call my dear friend, is an SMS fellow and Paul R. Lawrence, MBA class of 1942, professor at Harvard Business School. He holds a PhD from Harvard and a master's in management. From MIT's Sloan School. His work bridges strategy, organization design, and leadership. He will talk about his new book, Deep Purpose. Our discussant today is Laurence Capron, SMS Fellow and Professor of Strategy at INSEAD, where she holds a Paul Desmarais Chair in Partnership and Active Ownership. Her book, co-authored with Will Mitchell, Build borrow or buy, examines the challenges companies face when growing through organic growth or build, alliances or borrow, and M&As or buy. And I've got to tell you, I have used the book in my courses on strategic alliances, and it's a wonderful book. Let me say a few words about the format. So what we're going to do today is have Ranjay uh, present for roughly 20 minutes. And then Laurence and Ranjay will engage in a dialogue, in a back and forth, for another roughly 15 minutes, after which we will open it up for Q&A from the audience. And with that, Ranjay, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Axe, and thank you so much, Laurence. And I want to thank all of you for being here with us today. Uh, I'm delighted to have a chance to talk to you about my research. Uh, I must confess to you, I have never talked about anything in 20 minutes, but I'm going to give it a try. Uh, for those who know me, you know, I can't say anything in less than 20 minutes, but let's give it, I'm going to talk through my book, at least the basic premises. And I think I would much rather use not to summarize the book only, but to use it as a foil to have a conversation. Um, if any of you told me five years ago that you had a crystal ball and the crystal ball told you that you are going to write a book about purpose, I would have told you you're crazy, not a chance. This is far from what I want to study. Nothing and purpose to me was mission statements. Who reads mission statements? Who cares about mission statements? And then we had the CSR stuff going on as well. But I was interested in the subject and I had written co-authored a book with Rebecca Henderson, who's going to come next on looking at implementation of sustainability initiatives and in companies. But my interest was really in studying growth. I was doing a study of 
small company growth and the scaling problem that small companies face. Uh, with the doctor student, I've built a data set looking at companies that try to scale up. We had data on all Silicon Valley companies, and then we're doing a bunch of field interviews to understand this. And one of the kind of dilemmas we found in small company in derailing was there something was getting lost as they grew. And they were talking very kind of nostalgic terms about this thing, something that was lost. Uh, you know, the good old days. And I myself, my mother had started a business way in the early 70s, which I had seen go from zero to 3,000 employees back to zero. All around, something was getting lost. It was a fashion business that she had built in 1970 as an anthropologist. So I had kind of seen it. And when I did my field interviews with these entrepreneurs, I wanted to know what was it. And my mother used to talk about it too, that you know, as you get bigger, you lose something. The energy in the organization, the soul of the organization, something kind of starts to disappear. Couldn't put my finger on it. They would say purpose, mission, intent. And then actually I read Satya Nadella's book and I had a chance to interview Satya. And for those who don't know Microsoft's turnaround story, it's a remarkable story. And he talked about, he said, look, we had to do all the things you teach. We had to understand our markets. We had to build a strategy, right? So we figured out what's going on in our market. We built a strategy. And then we had to figure out how we're going to implement the strategy. So we had to think about our org structure. We had to think about our culture, the processes, the people, and we had to build the competencies in the organization and execute. So it was wonderful. I said, wow, strategy, strategy execution. He said, but you're missing something. If that's the story of Microsoft's turnaround, you miss something. We had to interrogate our purpose. And I was like, why would you need purpose? And he says, you know, purpose gave us not only a filtering system or a lens or a compass through which we could understand our strategy better and evaluate our strategic choices. But once we started to implement it, purpose became like an operating system to get everyone energized to do it. So that was at Microsoft. Then I was looking at Lego. I heard the same thing at Lego. I looked at Etsy. So there was something around purpose hovering. And there was also in the background, I had started some longitudinal research at BlackRock. And you know, you heard about conscious capitalism, you heard about his letters to the CEOs about purpose of organizations, the business roundtable jumping in there, the B Corp movement. So there was somehow that purpose was going to be the universal panacea, somehow was going to address a lot of issues. But purpose also had a lot of negativity around it. This is an article in Org Studies titled Sex, Lies, and Mission Statements, all around decoupling that was going on. Organizations doing impression management or decoupling, as, as uh, you know, Ed, Ed, my friend Ed Zajac would talk about, you know, how this kind of comes about that all these companies, Facebook, when they were in trouble, suddenly pulled out of purpose in 2016. And that got them off the hook. So you start to see, and then the Financial Times said the baffling search for purpose and purpose statements. So all this stuff was confusing to me. At one level, I see people talking about it in small and large companies as some animating force. I also see it kind of as there's a lot of cynicism around it. Now, if you look at the legal basis of this, right? The legal basis of having a purpose has evolved over time from obligation to consideration, right? And finance folks are all over this. And they were like, you know, purpose is useless. It's indeterminate. Right, doesn't tell you what to do and creates agency problems. You know, shareholder value optimization is clean, it's unenforceable, it's deliberately vague, it's unrealistic. Shareholders still prevail, as my good friend Jerry Davis has pointed out. That you know, you can talk all you want about purpose and all these things, but in the end of the day, for public companies, shareholder value optimization is a huge force, it's inadequate, can't resolve competing interests, it's undemocratic. The economist likes to say that you know, why should businesses be in the social business? And they equate purpose as social purpose, by the way. And I would tell you that purpose is not social purpose. So that was the other part of it. The people said purpose is shareholder value and purpose is anything but shareholder value. Oh, purpose is the CSR, you know? So we do shareholder and then we do purpose. You're like, wait a minute, purpose encompasses everything, making money also. So there was just a lot of confusion. And then people started calling it virtue signaling also called virtuous side hustles, social justice scams. These are harsh words people were using. But there was intriguing data, at least by some consulting firms. BCG's had a, a division called Bright House, which has been doing purpose work for 30 years. They had some intriguing data around this. That there, there's a correlation between purpose and TSR. An accounting professor at HBS, George Serafim, and his colleagues at Wharton, 
also found some interesting kind of correlations. Uh, some folks at IMD, uh, Tom Munland and others, were looking at high growth ventures to see what's common across these 28 high growth ventures. And purpose was one of the three themes. So there was some, but everyone also then talks about the same suspects. Patagonia, Ben & Jerry's, Unilever, Whole Foods, Salesforce, it's like a handful of companies. So my idea was to try to go beyond this and say, okay, is there something going on? So I followed uh, Kathy Eisenhardt's kind of exemplary companies idea that if you're gonna study a phenomenon that is kind of frontier phenomena, you have to find kind of exceptional exemplary organizations as she and Melissa Grebner talk about. So I began by looking at public representation of purpose in the media. I found 59 companies that had public representation in the media. I then, after deeper diving, was able to bring that number down to 34 and a further kind of deeper dive, bring it down to 18. And I will tell you, this is a COVID project. Uh, you know, thanks to COVID, I ended up doing 247 interviews at 18 companies. Uh, they seem to have all the time in the world, and so did I. And I tried my, you know, followed an inductive research process, you know, hypothesis generation, looking for constructs, connecting it to what people have researched before. And there's a follow up to this that I'm doing, where I'm now working on indexing purpose in companies using machine learning algorithms. So we're actually going to be indexing purpose of companies, public companies around the world, global sample. And we're going to try to see what are the antecedents and consequences of this purpose orientation. So there's a large sample project that is a, this was actually a preamble. These were supposed to help me get the large data, but this thing spun into something much bigger than I imagined. Um, so I ended up realizing that I had to look at this question. This is an important problem that there's a lot of confusion and a lot of kind of misinformation around. So before I could even study the topic, the phenomena, I had to understand what it is. Confusion about that. Why does it matter? The functional question, is it really matter? We say correlation between performance, but if there is a connection between purpose and performance, what are the pathways by which purpose activates performance? At least we can try to unpack that. And then the question was, how do you do it? I was trying to get to the how question, but I had to work my way through the what and the why question to get there. So let me start with the what question. Purpose is not a new idea. This is a notion that organizations are not a nexus of contracts only, but are a nexus of commitments. Goes back all the way to Chester Barnard, 1938, the function of the executive. He talked about organizing leaders' job. The function of the executive was to create a common connect around a purpose. An organization existed around a purpose. And that would be the animating force, not some kind of nexus of contracts where everyone was bartering their time for money. And that was the idea. And he wasn't alone. Philip Sesnick talked about it. When he talked about building institutionalizing work, how do you create a common cause, right? Peter Drucker talked about this in 1973. And these are relatively recent. If you go back in time, I want to do a shout out to Laurence's uh, person from their, her country is Emile Durkheim talked about this, right? The idea of a moral community, the idea that people come together around a common moral cause. And I say moral, li not likely, that we believe we can accomplish something. Now, I want to be very clear. Purpose is not some social idea. We are here to save the Amazon forest. The idea is we want to change the world in some way. So if you look at Starbucks or you look at Nike, they weren't saying we want to save the, they save the forest. They were saying we want to build a business that will radically transform the way something gets done. A marketplace is done. Or customers experience. You know, so how can we reimagine something in a very profound way? And that ideal which has a commercial and social component. I want to be very clear again, commercial and social component was what purpose these people were telling us about. It wasn't about go out and do CSR or only do shareholder. And they were saying, when you do that, you change the nature, the feel of the organization, what these entrepreneurs call the soul. And so I realized purpose is not a purpose statement. The statement is, I wouldn't say meaningless, but it is a composite of something much deeper than that. The companies that really did it took it much deeper than just a bunch of words. The superficial companies, which I call shallow purpose in my book, were the ones who had a statement, check the box, 
bl blast it out everywhere in your annual report and whatever you want to put it out there. But the ones who really went deep with it, and that's why the book is called Deep Purpose, really took it as an idea. We want to change something in the world. And this thing has ambitious goals, but it also comes with an idealistic cast of duties. We have a response, and this is where you start to then see a discussion about if you're building a long-term business, you have to think of stakeholders. Now, people also confuse stakeholder meaning environment. Well, stakeholder encompasses customers, stakeholder encompasses employees, stakeholders encompasses the communities in which you operate, and stakeholders do and does encompass the planet. Now, if you are building a long-term business, you're not going to ignore those stakeholders. You're not trying to say shareholders are the only thing that matter and customers don't care. I don't care. If you're short-term oriented, you might do that. But anyone interested in building a viable, successful business thought about purpose in terms of goals, duties, stakeholders, and a long-term vision while delivering on short-term results. Short-term results were progress towards achieving your long-term goals. So how do you craft a long-term vision? You, and you see this in growth equity companies, actually, by the way, if you look at Tesla and Amazon, they have been masters of telling us an idea. They said, we're not going to make money right now, but where that's our eye on the prize. So from my standpoint, I discovered that purpose is not some management tactical tool. It's not yet another business process re-engineering or total quality or some kind of new, new bandwagon thing. It was actually much more profound. It was an existential intention that goes back to the work of Durkheim, Drucker, Selznick, and Barnard. It was about how you make sense of the world, as Carl White would talk about. It. What's your lens into understanding your market and your place in the marketplace? Right? It was very much about identity, as Denny Joya or Violina Rindova or anybody else would talk about identity and say, you know, it's about how we think about ourselves. And it was about motivation in terms of collective job crafting. So if you think about, you know, Jane Dutton and Amy Rusinski's work, this is about collective job crafting. Why do we, we, not me, why do we do what we do? And so it was at a collective level. I do a shout out to my former doctor, student, Luciana Silvestri, who looked at team level job crafting. I would say it's organization level job crafting also. So that was what I did. Purpose is not a purpose statement. It was something bigger than that. Then the question was, does purpose really matter? Everyone says correlation, purpose, performance. And some said purpose is a tax on business, especially the ones who thought of purpose as CSR. And then I met this gentleman uh, who's the chairman of Orsted, one of the amazing transformation of, of a company from traditional energy to green energy company in Europe. He said, I pity those who think of purpose coming at the expense of performance. And so I pushed him on that. I said, what do you mean? He said, the problem is people confuse that purpose can actually enhance performance. And I said, how? Everyone says, yes, I want to know how. And by the way, what's your definition of performance? Is it financial, social? What are you talking about? And after a long journey, I finally uncovered there were four mechanisms, pathways by which purpose activated performance. The first one was directional. And I think this is important to think about for us as strategists here that purpose was an important precursor to crafting a strategy. The way Satya Nadella talked about it. And Satya wasn't the first one. Our good friend, late, uh, late Sumatra Ghoshal and Chris Bartlett wrote about this a long time. In one of the last works that Sumatra wrote, he talked about purpose as being a precursor to strategy, as a way to really reimagine your strategy, what Carl Weick might have called sense-making also, it was a frame, a cognitive frame through which you looked at what you do. Or Cynthia Montgomery at, at HBS, my colleague, talks about how does the world look at you? So and Rebecca in her work has also talked about how pur purpose orientation drives greater innovation, creativity, a more expansive view of the markets in which you operate, the value proposition you're trying to build. So that was the first one. The second one I thought was interesting is motivation. And you may, we may all say, oh, this is a modern phenomenon with the great resignation that people are calling the great rethink, that people expect more post-COVID, there's a meaning revolution going on and people want more out of work. Absolutely true. I think that's happening, but it's not just young people. I think there's a broad rethink about work going on. 
how we think about work. And I'm going to show you some data in a minute showing that people, they used to be the holy grail in human resources was satisfaction, job satisfaction. Then it moved to job engagement. Engagement became the thing. And now it's inspiration, inspired work. In a study that in 2015 showed that inspired workers are 2.2 times as productive as satisfied workers. So how do we imagine an organization where there's a common cause? And this goes back to Durkheim's imagination of the moral community, where people come together around a common cause as an energizing force. And that in turn elevates performance. Now, to a common thing between Axe, my good friend Axe and me, relational. I found companies that had a purpose using, not using, but a lot, enable, purpose became an enabler to building greater trust with your ecosystem partners. People saw you as standing for something. When you stood for something and you really acted on your beliefs. So one of the organizations I studied is a company called Bueller. And Bueller has activated its entire value chain of partners, its customers and also others in the value chain around their purpose. And I interviewed some of their counterparties and they said, yes, purpose matters to me in the way I look at Bueller. How I experience Bueller is different. So purpose becomes an indicator, a marker, a signal of trustworthiness. And Laurence, to your work as well, you know, you're going to talk about mergers and acquisitions in other contexts. We can start to think about how purpose becomes a marker or a filter through which we look at other organizations in this inter-organizational world. And the last one on which there's a lot of work in marketing is purpose branding. Customer uh, are more loyal and again, more trusting of organizations with purpose. So I was like, yes, we can debate it. I'm in the middle of measuring purpose and trying to do some analysis on purpose and performance myself with a large data set. And I hope to do that very soon. But I had to understand the mechanism by which this may manifest itself. And I found there were four and not all manifest in all organizational contexts. But I want to just show you this data. It was stunning to see that, you know, how purpose energizes employees. And by the way, in this purpose motivational, I want to add one more wrinkle to this. In many organizations, not all, the leader said, I can't get employees to buy into company purpose until they themselves have their own purpose. So we're going to start an initiative to get employees to interrogate what is your purpose. And because when you are in that zone of purpose, you will be more receptive to a company purpose. No, this idea that the janitor saying a man, or I'm going to, Mr. President, we're putting a man on the moon. So I found this in all kinds of contexts. This is a sports context. Now I got to the last part of the puzzle, which is the bulk of my book. So I'm going to tee it up and I'm going to hand over to Laurence in a minute or two. The how question was really hard. Now, if you look at this, this is what Satya had to say to me. He said, look, Ranjay, writing a purpose is easy. What comes next is much harder. How do you embed purpose in an organization is the, the heart of the challenge. And, and I think is what I discovered is that writing it was easy, but disseminating is much harder. And to tip my, you know, raise my hat to the late Jim, Jim March, he had talked about leaders being poets and not just plumbers. In his organizational science piece, he talked about poetry and not plumbing. And you see that as actually what happens because Drew Carton in his ASQ paper showed us that there's a paradox. The very properties that make ultimate aspirations meaningful are those that leave employees unable to sense how their daily responses are associated with them. So how do you make it real? How do you connect it to the individual was very, very hard. And the data actually showed, this is a study again that came out in organization science, the purpose actually exponentially decays across hierarchy. So how do we do that? So I've already told you about purpose and performance, the four, four pathways. In the book, I just looked at how companies discover their purpose. And I look at the fascinating work of nostalgia and nostalgia uh, that has been done by uh, Violina and others. I looked at dissemination. How do you share that purpose? Drew Carton's work in ASQ was very informative here, as were other pieces of work. Rewiring the organization. This is where my colleague Mike Tushman's work, 
looking at congruence, looking at how do you get hardware and software of the organization working for you, and how do you reaffirm purpose? This is not a one-time deal that, okay, declare victory, check the box, we have a purpose, we're done. So there's a lot of dynamics at play here. I wanna just point out purpose becomes a channel for attentional control and engagement, is a platform to attract and develop new talent, is a cultural reinforcer, is a catalyst for looser structures, it becomes a way to, you know, how do we think about this? And for inter intra and inter-organizational connection. So to me, the realization was purpose is a compass as an orienting system for our strategy and purpose is an operating system on how things get done in the organization. So I'll end with one last quote here, which says that the late long time ago, Henry David Thoreau said, it's not enough to be industrious, so are the ants. What are you industrious about? As I said, five years ago, if, I, if you asked me, I was writing a book about this topic, I would say never, but here I am. And so COVID really did, uh, you know, to transform me in some way. I am now looking at how using my large data set that I've been working with two of my co-authors on, we are looking at how this explains intra and inter-organizational behavior and, is, and also performance, both as an independent variable and as a dependent variable. I think that reconnecting to purpose, I think is gonna be a really, and now today with Ukraine and all this stuff going on, businesses are being forced to take positions on things. So I think purpose is gonna be much more salient than it ever has been as we expect more from business, we expect more from our jobs. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Axe. I really appreciate it. Laurence, thank you so much for taking the time to read my book and thank you all for joining and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Okay, thank you, Ranjay. That, that was really terrific. Uh, Laurence, uh, yeah. what would you have to say yeah. to Ranjay's presentation yeah. and his ideas? Thanks, Ranjay, and thanks, uh, Ax, for inviting me to discuss uh, Ranjay's book, a Deep Purpose. I learned a lot huh, from the reading the rich stories of companies that uh, embark on a transformation journey uh, to become a Deep Purpose organization. Uh, Ranjay, as a strategy scholar, I would like to discuss uh, a few topics, uh, a few topics that relate to uh, our field of strategy research and teaching. Uh, the first topic is around uh, the portfolio choices and balance. Uh, I think for me, one of the main challenges uh, is how company can straddle their kind of legacy business that can be seen as not doing uh, social good and the new set of activity they develop to become a deep purpose organization. And you mentioned in your book um, the importance of making a distinction between uh, the organization that follow a shallow kind of convenient purpose uh, from those that kind of follow a deep uh, purpose, right? And so I was wondering how you could make such a clear cut uh, empirical classification if we were to, again, try to do research on this topic, because for instance, uh, you develop an interesting example on Mars as adopting a convenient purpose because uh, they have not yet divested uh, their unhealthy product businesses. And at the same time, I was intrigued because PepsiCo uh, seems to be classified as a deep purpose organization. And at the same time, PepsiCo has still 50% uh, of its portfolio uh, in this unhealthy uh, food uh, segment. So, so I was wondering if you could uh, clarify uh, this notion of convenient versus not convenient purpose. So Lawrence, I think it's an excellent question. And I think one definitely worthy of conversation. Um, I first want to clarify that to me, the idea was that there are companies that talk a lot about purpose. And that's why I had to, I ended up starting with this taxonomy of shallow purpose. You know, for one was purpose is just a smoke screen. You know, the Theranos and the Enron and the Purdue pharmaceuticals of the world. Then there was purpose on the sidelines. Purpose is CSR. Purpose I do on the hobby as a 10, I give away a little money to charity. And then I say I'm a purpose company. So I had to kind of call those out. Then there was purpose as win-win. Oh, I do purpose when it's good for me. So if I can make money doing it, then I'll do something good for society, but I'm just doing it by myself. So the idea was how do I make purpose an integral part of who I am? Now, you're right that if you have a legacy business, if you look at BP, for instance, today, right? British Petroleum, you know, BP is in the legacy business. But what I think is, what to me gives me comfort and hope 
And why I give them a benefit of doubt is that they have openly, publicly committed to a transition journey to get to somewhere else, to a better place, right? Uh, it may never be perfect. So in fact, I just wrote an article that came out called The Messiness of Purpose. Purpose is not perfection. So I don't want to say deep purpose companies are perfect. Everything is beautiful. They're in heaven. Yeah. They're, it's messy. But I think, and if they're in un legacy businesses, at least they have a journey. So if you look at Pepsi under uh, uh, Indra and then her successor, sure, they sell colas and they sell junk food, but they mapped out a journey. They said, look, here's our target right? We're going to reduce the unhealthy component of what we call nice for you, or you like to have this stuff. But reduce the percentage of that product we're selling. We're going to increase the percentage of healthy products. We're going to take our unhealthy products and try to make them healthier by reducing sugar content and reducing sodium content. So we are, we are mapping out a journey, right? We're not going to, even the end place is not going to be perfect. We're still going to sell unhealthy food, but we have a journey. Why I took issue with a company like Mars is they don't have a journey. They're doing, they fund research centers on purpose, about purpose, by the way. So they fund a research center on purpose. They do lots of good charity work, but they don't want to mess with the core of their business. And the idea is purpose is about the core of what you do. How you may have a journey to get to perfection or maybe never get there. So that's the reason I took issue. Now to your larger question, how do you empirically do this? That's going to be the hardest part. That's what I'm embarked on now is can I actually operationalize mm -hmm. and say, here are the criteria. What I was doing then was really subjective. Um, but I think now the question is, can you actually put companies because you're trying to measure them on intention, right? Lawrence? So how do you measure intention? That becomes very hard. So you have to, I'm discovering you can't measure intention, right? Yeah. But go ahead. And so my second related point is really around the, you know, if you think of liter our literature and strategy on, on B dexterity, innovation, exploitation, exploration, uh, I mean, you, you, you seem to be critical in your book of the organizations that separate their doing good through CSR activity from their doing well through their core businesses. And, but if we relate to the literature on, on B dexterity, for instance, where you can have, you can choose between contextual or structural a separation and bit dexterity, uh, isn't that an initial phase of transformation when you try first to go for structural separations? That and I was wondering how deep purpose organization ride the cycle of purpose, purpose orientation, and profit purpose. So how, how do you make sense of that? That's a great question, and I and and that's a I, I love the way you've juxtaposed the literature into this as well. Um, I would like to do a shout out to actually my colleague Julie Batalana's work on hybrid organizing as well. And the reason I take, uh, I think the explore, exploit and separating it out is great. Purpose is not some kind of innovative, new novel idea that you're pursuing. It's not disruptive innovation the way Clay Christensen would talk about it, that you have to separate it. Purpose is about what are we doing? What's our core business? Why are we here? So purpose is not a hobby project that you park on the side. The problem is people equate purpose with social purpose and say, oh, purpose is anything but profit. But purpose is about what business are we in? And so I think it has to operate there. Now it creates a tension because you're now holding social and commercial objectives simultaneously, which is what Julie beautifully elaborates on that is very hard to do. So it's much easier to say social, head of CSR, you deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. I'm just going to run my business as it is. But to incorporate that into the very operating rhythm of what you do is much harder to do. And you have to hold that tension. So now I'm going to take the hat of uh, a corporate strategy scholar thinking of the scope extension and growth of the firm. I mean, I think your book does a very good job at exploring uh, the roots of a deep purpose organization, the role of the inspirational leader, charismatic leader. Uh, you also stress uh, the, difficult, the difficulties of sustaining a sense of purpose over time and how it is important to manage leadership transitions. And, and you mentioned overcoming the uh, personification paradox. Um, again, as corporate strategy scholar, I can also foresee a lot of challenges of maintaining the social purpose when companies make scope changing decisions through MAs, joint ventures, divestment. And so I was wondering how firm can 
extend their deep purpose DNA and processes across the firm boundaries as they embark on acquisitive growth or alliance-based growth? Roland, I think that's an excellent question. And I think what you're doing, I think is very helpful because you're looking at what are the, if we take purpose seriously. So if we take purpose as a construct seriously, then there are massive consequences for our research and strategy. And given that we're in a mature phase of strategy research, I hope this will inject some new ideas into our field. One of them being that, you know, to what degree is there kind of purpose dilution or purpose shock when you engage in an acquisition? To what degree do you use purpose as a filter to make some of those scope choice decisions? You also look at CEO turnover and you can look at how, to what degree does departure of a lead incumbent CEO and tenure is an important component of it or founder is an important component of it. To what degree does that create challenges subsequently for organizations? These are empirical questions that I think really merit further study. Or the one I said to you earlier, purpose creates relational capabilities as my uh, friend Harbir, who I hope is here, Harbir would talk about it and Jeff Dyer would talk about relational capabilities, right? So, and I can't forget Axe over here. He, the, the three of them really are the people who've defined relational capabilities here. You know, that's critical, right? So you say, can purpose be an index of that? So I think there's, a, there's gonna be some really interesting, I hope, questions if we take this construct seriously. Thank you very much. So another set of questions is around the uh, national institutional environment, uh, because another challenge for implementing a deep purpose organization is linked to the uh, heterogeneity uh, of the institutional environment, right? As you span, as companies span multiple geographic markets with different national institutional environment, uh, they will face, of course, different frictions to implement. Uh, their kind of deep purpose principles or DNA, right? If you think of country with stakeholder versus shareholder capitalism uh, environment. So are the principles and the trade-off uh, managed differently across country from what you have observed? I mean, can company go at different paces and how do they manage uh, the hostility from a set of stakeholders across uh, the different countries? Yeah. So, uh, it's an excellent question for a global scholar, uh, Laurence. I think the idea that how do we think about heterogeneity across different contexts and, and purpose. So I want to remind you again, purpose to me encompasses both commercial and social objectives, right? Multi-stakeholder encompasses shareholders, customers, employees, all those elements as well. I think you're touching on something I think that is a huge issue. I think we all have to do a better job as researchers coming at. Society expects more of businesses today than ever before, right? Ukraine is a game changer when suddenly they say, where, where are you on Russia? Are you in or are you out? And you can see how Uniqlo response was, well, Zara is leaving, but we're not leaving because clothing is a human right and we don't want to leave and everyone deserves clothes. And then five days later, Uniqlo is out too, right? So you can see a diffusion of pressure, if you will, so I think what is happening is that now we can be very ad hoc in responding to each context. And, but purpose creates something else. So I go back to Thomas Toon Anderson, who said to me, he said, you know, purpose allowed us to make demands of our stakeholders, not react to them only. Otherwise we used to react to them saying, what do you want? No, I can't do that. No, can we compromise? You know, I can't, yes, no, tug of war across different stakeholders. He said, Purpose gives us the opportunity to make demands of our stakeholders. It changes the conversation, but having said that, you're right that how can a global company like a Microsoft or a Lego take a purpose that is a headquarter-centered exercise and A, get employees to believe it and buy into it globally, but then use it as a basis for conversation with the local communities in which they operate. And if you believe Larry Fink's statement and others talking about deglobalization is the next wave of what's going to come now. How is that going to play into what we're trying to do? So as we have deglobalization coming into the con, I think we as strategy scholars need to think about these things much more seriously. Yeah. So thank you, Renji, very much. I think you uh, asked, uh, uh, we can open up the floor uh, for the participants. Uh, I, I think we have a little bit of time. So let me... Let me try and hold Ranjay's feet to the fire, which I uh, love to do. So Ranjay, the, uh, you know, one of the big stories in your book, one of the big themes is that 
uh, you've got to do both social purpose as well as commercial purpose. So purpose involves both. And the pathway to get there, you say, you start with commercial purpose and then add on social purpose, or you start with social purpose and then add on commercial purpose. But it seems to me that it's, it seems a little too, if you pardon the, the expressions, it seems like a cop-out because, you know, it, it seems that it, this is easy to do. It's a natural way of doing things. You can always find a social component to a commercial project and a commercial component to a social project. And so therefore it behooves us as, as companies uh, to try and do both, which will fulfill the objective of, you know, purpose encompassing both sides. But that's not the way the world often works, right? You try your darnest and you cannot find a social purpose to certain commercial things, like you just said. Uh, so where does that leave us? So is, it, is this just convenience, that, yeah. you know, a win-win, which is a, a cozy, you know, nice place to be? But it's really, really an idealistic perspective, yeah. Rajay. Don't so you think? Absolutely, Axe. I, I, I have to agree with you and disagree with you both. Uh, I agree with your general sentiment of what you said, but actually what you said is exactly what I say in my book. So I don't get the sense of disagreement. What I did with the stylized two by two was take issue with the win-win scholars, which includes, and I think Michael Porter, who wrote this great article on shared value, which really became a pioneering article that came out a couple of years ago, and his point was that businesses are going to become much more, and Rebecca in her book talks about this as well, that businesses, once they understand purpose, will become much more creative in seeking ways to have win-win possibilities, where there is social and commercial coming together at the intersection. Now, you have scholars like Colin Nair at Oxford who take objection to this. They say, and win-win is a dangerous, they say win-win is a dangerous construct because that means businesses will only do good when they can make money doing it. You're only operating on that intersection set of social and commercial. The reason I drew out that stylized two by two was to say that a lot of life is not in perfection, win-win or none other, is in the off diagonals. So you have things that are commercially good for you, but there's no social impact of it. You don't have it. And there are things that are socially good, but no commercial impact. And we have to learn to live with that tension. And we have to keep trying to work everything towards women, but we have to learn to live with them. And that's why Lawrence's question was a great one on Pepsi. They have to sell cola. If they don't sell cola, they're out of business. But then they have to balance that against other things they do that have a more healthier component. And then they sell oatmeal that does both. So how do you come up with a portfolio? And that's why the description I use of these leaders is what I call practical idealists. What's happened is all this work on conscious capitalism and uh, all these things, they paint a very idealistic view of the world. That, you know, we can go from narrow shareholder value to only social value, and somehow money making is a bad thing, it's a side thing, you do on the side. And I'm saying, no, you have to learn to live in the off diagonals. And I'll give you a simple example with the accent. So the Walmart CEO came and gave a talk about 10 years ago. And he said, Hurricane Katrina had happened. He said, you know, sustainability is going to be huge. We see it coming. We have to do something. You know what we're going to do? We're going to put solar panels on all rooftops of all Walmarts. We're going to lose money doing it. And Walmart is cheap. But you know what? We're going to find a way to make money doing it. We're going to just do it. So he mandated they did it. And sure enough, in a couple of years, they broke even. And in a couple of years, there was an economically viable case for it. But that leap of faith, and that's the point I wanted to make that sometimes you make leaps of faith on the social dimension, hoping to find a commercial component and you have to learn to live with the portfolio. I'm actually really glad you asked that question because I think it's an important piece of clarifying this purpose thing. You're right that, you know, the purpose is social, purpose is commercial. And I, I'm really glad you raised that two by two. Okay, thank you, Ranjay. Uh, let's go to the questions. Uh, Rafi Amit says, uh, is there a downside to deep purpose? Hi, Rafi. As always, Rafi has the zinger questions. 
So he hasn't lost his touch. Great to hear from you. Absolutely, Rafi. I think is you know first of all, purpose downside is when it's fake. People see people in a in such a cynical world we're in today. When you fake it, it's actually a demoralizer. So I want to be very clear about that. That's number one. Number two, when you have deep purpose, somehow human beings we personify it in a leader. And when the leader leaves, you can see Howard Schultz. The poor guy can't find. He keeps coming back as CEO for the third time now. You know, so you start to embody the purpose. What Lawrence was talking about is the personalized personification paradox. So you have to deal with that. Succession becomes much harder to tackle, right? And it's I I have to say to you one thing I learned is costly in terms of time and effort. When you think about Jim March's idea about leaders as poets and plumbers. Plumbing leadership is very easy, relatively speaking. Build the strategy, build the team, put the KPIs in place, and you know, run around doing kind of plumbing. Being a poet is a lot more work. It's a much harder job, and so it is time-consuming. I would totally agree with you. But the payoffs hopefully justify the time spent. It's a good question. Thank you. A uh, question from Gunter Muller Stevens. I assume that deep purpose, just like a strong culture, can also be an obstacle to necessary strategic change when fundamental change is called for. What do you think? Okay. Excellent question. First of all, I'm, I'm really glad you raised that question because purpose and culture are distinct constructs. If you read the Microsoft turnaround, they talked about two things they were going to do that were going to be transformative, work on the purpose and work on culture. They said these are the guardrails, the constants we want to have in our lives. Strategy, organization design, everything will change. Those are not going to change. And there are very distinct constructs that work in parallel and reinforce each other. So I want to just put that out there for your consideration. And I have a whole section on that. But the other point you make is a very interesting one, is about refreshing purpose. So if you, I looked at Best Buy. So Best Buy had already been through three purposes in 20 years. But when Hubert Jolie took over, he said, you know what, we need a new purpose. We have to refresh our purpose. Now, we're not going to, and same happened at Microsoft. The same happened at Lego. What is interesting is when they refresh their purpose, they engage in not just disavowing the past. The fine line is how do you connect the purpose to the past while imagining a new future? So you're absolutely right that purpose refresh is something you start to see. Or look at Johnson & Johnson with the credo. Um, you know, they had a credo challenge just before the Tylenol crisis. So when the Tylenol crisis happened, they had the purpose in their fingertips. And then uh, 20 years ago, they had a decade of crises, really bad crises. And then the last CEO, Alex Gorky, he started a credo challenge. And they refreshed their credo, which dates back to the founding days. So how do you engage in a refresh with your purpose is a very fair question. Okay. Uh, and David Booth has actually asked that specific question, Ranjay. How does an organization know when it's time to refresh purpose? And I think you've mostly answered that. Do you want to take another stab at it? Uh, I think, you know, I think you need to think about purpose when you stop thinking about it. When it becomes taken for granted and it becomes wallpaper, that's the time to say to ourselves, like, hey, we need to either take it seriously or we need to change it, right? There's something missing here. If you look at Boeing right now, look at the disconnect. They say, what happened to Boeing? How did it lose its way? What went wrong at Boeing, right? An iconic organization, or Johnson & Johnson. So I think it's time to, when you stop thinking about it, is when you need to either refresh or rethink it. Okay. A uh, question from, uh, from Arun Pilutla. Uh, why was Satya and Microsoft engaged in an exercise to find their deep purpose, uh, but not their competitors? And what's the context or situation of Microsoft that prompted the search? I don't like to uh, give lots of blame or credit to individuals, but I would definitely give credit here to Satya and his, and his team, uh, in particular, Kathleen Hogan, their CHRO. Um, you know, their whole thinking was something is missing in Microsoft and you could blame it on the culture. They said the culture is broken. He said the culture is sick. We are sick. 
it's not just a broken strategy, but we as an organization are not performing to our fullest potential. And so in that inner journey, actually, it began with an interrogation of personal purpose. So if you want to know the detail, I'll share with you. They actually had a little leadership offsite, Satya and his team, and they brought in the team psychologist of the Seattle Seahawks, Michael Gervais. And Michael Gervais helps players perform better by thinking about their personal purpose. So he asked these leaders to talk about their personal purpose. And it turned into an animating conversation. It's described in his book as well. And I actually interviewed Michael Gervais too in my research. And so he described it to me. And he said, you know, and this became kind of a conversation starter that if our own purpose can be such an inspiring force, what if we can do it for the collective? And how can we then channel that for everybody? And, and by the way, everybody should have a personal purpose. So they retained Michael Gervais to build a training program, online training course for individual purpose activation for everybody who works at Microsoft. And then they had this Microsoft purpose as well. And I want to leave you with one sentence. The, Kathleen Hogan, the CHRO said, you don't really work for Microsoft until Microsoft works for you. Uh, thank you, Ranjit. That's wonderful. Actually, let me ask a follow on to that question itself, because when I was reading your book, the thought occurred to me, what if your purpose, your personal purpose, doesn't jive with the organization's purpose? Does that mean you're a misfit and you should leave? You should be fired? How, how do you get everyone's purpose to, you know, find a connection with the company purpose? Isn't that asking for too much? So also a great question, Ax. I tell you what I, maybe this is my own personal midlife journey uh, interrogation. I discovered that personal purpose has many layers to it. It's a layered construct. We have purpose in our life, what I want in my life. We have purpose in our job, what do I want in the immediate job? And we have purpose in our career. How do I see my career and the impact I want to have? So Microsoft is trying to find an intersection and these are connected and they're hopefully somewhat harmonious constructs in our individual lives. So Microsoft is not saying you want to go to Mount Everest, I'll help you go to Mount Everest. I'll write a software for you to tell you to take you to Mount Everest. No, they're saying, think about your work purpose and your career purpose. And can I help you manifest that through the work you do at Microsoft? And I think that's the part of purpose they want to do. And I think is they're tapping into a human need, a latent human need for impact on others, making a difference. And I think it elevates, that's where inspired work comes when we feel we are making a contribution to something bigger than ourselves. And it's that tapping in, even if it's customers, and we're gonna make money doing it, but I am making a contribution in some way to having an impact and helping you see that impact of what you do impact something in a positive, meaningful way. I think that's the idea. So it's not saying your life purpose is, you know, I want to be a better golfer and I want to enjoy my wine cellar and I really want to travel. I'm not talking about acts. I'm talking about just in general over here, but how do we reconcile that with what we accomplish at work as educators? Okay. By the way, Laurence, please feel free to jump in uh, if you have, uh, you know. Yeah, uh, there, there is a question which also I have the same question from uh, Gert Human about, uh, can you share some thought on the research agenda on the deep purpose? And I had similar question about, yes, if you think of the future avenue for researchers in our field, what would be your, your view on that? So I'll just share with you my research and I hope others may want to jump into this. First, I think purpose is a serious construct. We should think about that, right? Conceptually, theoretically, how does it relate to trust? How does it relate to scope decisions? How does it relate to innovation? How does it relate to positive contributions, CSR? How does it relate to brand reputation and growth? So conceptually, we can think about purpose. And I'm working on a conceptual paper right now, which maps out kind of the idea of what is purpose as a construct. And I think that's a conceptual question. I think empirically, if we can, to your earlier question, Laurent, is if we can empirically, I 
was a little glib actually in saying, oh, deep purpose. And I, and you correctly point out, so how do you know when is deep? Pepsi is deep, Mars is not. And you're right. I mean, I arbitrarily somewhat made that distinction. I think we now I'm going much more granular in trying to, because I'm using large data sets. And so now the question is, how can we, and even that, you know, is problematic because you're relying on self-representation. Annual reports, media reports, these are self-representations, not really what's going on. So then you start to measure, because companies are now increasingly reporting sustainability reports, integrated reports. So you start to see other other markers. We can ESG scores. All these are noisy right now. ESG scores are very noisy. So how can we empirically classify organizations around their purpose organization, indexing that, and then thinking of the antecedents and consequences of purpose in inter-organizational relationships, in mergers and acquisitions, in kind of business scope. Uh, there's a full range of topics, I think, that we can solve. Let me follow up on the teaching side now, because in your book, you describe uh, examples of people kind of bigger than life, right? If you think of uh, Indra Nui at PepsiCo, if you think of Emmanuel Faber at Danone, here you have kind of amazing people with amazing story and, and so on, right? And a lot of charisma and gravitas and so on. Can it be taught? If you think of a regular MBA student joining organization and we want to kind of develop them a sense of social purpose and uh, uh, can it be taught? Because usually we kind of teach skills, competencies and here we need to kind of develop characters, right? And, and so how would you kind of think of this uh, balance between uh, developing competencies but also characters in, in your regular teaching activities? So Lawrence, for 10 years or so, I ran the EMP program at HBS. And as the chair of the program, you know, I kind of got to craft the curriculum. And, and the joke in the EMP was people would talk about how many of them would quit their jobs after they went back. And some would even get divorced after they went back. And so I was like, this is crazy. I don't want to know, first of all, the data. This is kind of scary. So I said, we should have a coach for all of them. And these are, mind you, average age 54 years old, right? From, 45 countries around the world. We have 350 of them a year. And, and so I had the coaches develop a curriculum that in eight weeks, they would write down a personal purpose statement. And then, so that was part, but they had classes six days a week, marketing, finance, operations, organization study, strategy, everything, you know, and we cherry pick our faculty for this. And so it was like, okay, at the end in their feedback events, right there near the top, was what is the most valuable thing I got out of this program? To leave with a stronger sense of my purpose. Who am I? Why am I here? We have a course at HBS in the MBA program called ALB where they do the same thing. So grounding ourselves in our own personal purpose. And I should tell you, the psychological, the, the, this data now on purpose orientation and well-being, <laughs> longevity, um, health outcomes, uh, resilience, adversity, dealing, dealing with adversity, even heart, uh, heart attacks, strokes, dementia, purpose and values orientation are major markers of a healthy, productive life. By the way, workers are much more productive. So there's a whole bunch of benefits that flow from having a personal purpose. The other part, I think we have to educate our strategy scholars is saying, listen, choose to work at an organization with a purpose that resonates with your personal purpose, right? So as you imagine where you're going to go work, and then as a leader, your job is not just to be the plumber, building a strategy and implementation plan. Your okay. job as a leader is to also energize the organization and you bring energy into the organization. And I want to go back to Peter Drucker, Chester Barnard, Philip Sells, you, all had this that? idea. We'll have to leave it there, I'm afraid. So wonderful, wonderful, and amazing presentation. Wonderful ideas. Thank you uh, for such an enriching seminar, webinar, and Laurence, wonderful questions as well. I just wanted to remind everyone uh, once again about Rebecca Henderson uh, and Rachi Agarwal, who are on on May 3rd at 10 a.m. Eastern. So with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you, SMS. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Ryan. 
And thank you again, Ranjay and Bogos. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.